Hello, my name is Jack Ross, and I'm here with you today to emphasize the importance of safety, especially when you're doing science experiments. But safety goes well beyond the classroom. Each day we come in contact with unknown chemicals. We come in contact with equipment that we may not know how to operate properly. So it's always important to be safe. Let's start by taking a look at these four white powders I have on the table. You may have done an experiment called mystery powders. Well, these could very well be one of the mystery powders that you've worked with. Now, if I asked you to come up and test these, do some experiments with them, and try and figure out what they were, would you taste it, or touch it, or smell it? Would that be safe if you didn't know what it was? Well, we're going to do one experiment. I'm going to add just one drop of water to each little powder, and we'll see what happens. But before we do this experiment, I've learned from experience, it's always good to protect your clothes. Lab coats work fine, and if you don't have a lab coat, you should wear some old clothes whenever you do science experiments, because sometimes you never know what's going to happen. I should move this microphone, too. I'll put it here on the lab coat. Now, another important thing to do is to have safety goggles. When you do science experiments, particularly ones that are boiling or splattering, or you're not sure what's going to happen, you should have a good pair of safety goggles to wear. And safety goggles are not, as a lot of students think, forehead protectors. They're not to be worn up here unless you're away from your experiment. They're to protect your eyes. Now what we're going to do, take this glass stirring rod and this little beaker with water in it and put one drop of water on each chemical. We'll start with number one and see what happens. There appears to be very little reaction. Now let's test number two. Wow! Imagine what would have happened if we tasted that chemical. Now let's test number three. One drop of water on chemical number three. And once again, we can see that it does very little. And finally, chemical number four. Let's see what happens when we put our drop on that. Whoa, it's like another one of those. The important message here is never taste touch or smell any unknown chemical unless you're sure you know what it is. And this goes well beyond the science classroom. It goes into everyday life, particularly in drug use. Think about those chemicals. What's in with them? What's mixed with them? Is there anything that's real dangerous? You never really know. And another important thing is that when you're doing a science experiment with unpredictable results, such as we have here, it's very important to start with small amounts of chemical to see what's going to happen. Imagine what might have happened if we used two or three times as much of that white powder. It's also important to know the name and the proper use of each piece of science equipment. When the directions say fill a graduated cylinder up to 50 milliliters and then transfer the liquid into a Erlenmeyer flask, what are you going to do? You've got to know what it is and what it's used for. We're going to take some time in this next section to review the different pieces of equipment and their functions. Let's start by examining glassware. On my right, you see a number of test tubes. Everybody knows what they are. The one that's upside down is drying, and there's a test tube brush at the bottom used for cleaning them. Next to the test tube rack, we have two different types of beakers. One is plastic, and the other is glass. Beakers come in all sizes. Over here we have a funnel. Of course, everybody knows what that is. Then we have three different types of flasks. Try and remember the names of these. This first one is called an Erlenmeyer flask. It has a triangular shape. That's how we remember it. And this one holds 250 milliliters. Next to it, we have a much smaller baby Erlenmeyer flask, which only holds 50 milliliters of liquid. Next to that, we have what's called a Florence flask. This Florence flask has a long neck and a round shape to it. And this particular one has a flat bottom, so it'll stand by itself. If you have a flask that looks like a Florence flask but has a smaller neck, we call it a boiling flask. And this particular boiling flask doesn't have a flat bottom, so it has to be supported by something or held up with a clamp. Otherwise, it'll fall over. Then we have what we call a reagent bottle. This particular reagent bottle has sulfuric acid in it. The stopper at the top is called just that, a glass stopper. 
We also have other types of stoppers too. In this Erlenmeyer flask, we have a stopper made out of rubber, called a rubber stopper. Then if we have one made out of cork, it's not called a stopper anymore, but rather a cork. Then we have the instrument that we use to measure liquid volume, the amount of space that a liquid takes up. It's called a graduated cylinder. You can remember the name of this because it's cylindrical in shape and has marks or graduations along the outside, usually in milliliters. Graduated cylinders come in all sizes. These two both hold only 10 milliliters. One is made of plastic, the other is made of glass. Incidentally, the ring around the top of these is called a cylinder guard. It's meant to protect the cylinder, not to be slid down to measure liquids. It always stays at the top. And the purpose of it is that if the graduated cylinder happens to get knocked over, then this little ring will save it. Watch what happens when we knock it over. The only time the cylinder guard won't help you is that if it falls off the edge of a table or into a sink, then it might do an endo and break at the base or somewhere. One of my students wasn't cautious enough, had the ring down here, and look at what happened to the top of this one. Graduated cylinders are precision instruments and cost quite a bit, so be careful when you're using them. Now let's take a look at some of these other items we have down here. This piece of curved glass is called a watch glass. You don't look through it this way, but rather you set it on the table and put things in it to watch. Next to it, we have two different types of crucibles. This is a small baby crucible, and this one is a much larger one. These are made out of porcelain and used to heat things up in. Then if you're working in biology, you should definitely know what this is. It's called a Petri dish, a two-piece glass or plastic dish used to grow microorganisms. Then we have these things. You've seen these before. We don't call them eyedroppers, but just droppers. This dish over here is called an evaporating dish, and this one's made out of porcelain. Then we have our glass tubes and our glass stirring rods, like the one we used in the last experiment. This is called a mortar and pestle. This is the pestle and this is the mortar, and it's used to grind up chemicals. Next I see a special type of funnel. It's called a thistle tube funnel. It's a regular funnel with a very long tube on it. Then I have two different instruments for measuring liquid volume again, like our graduated cylinder. One of them is called a pipette, and it measures very small amounts of liquid. This particular one measures only two milliliters. And finally, this long glass tube over here is called a burette, and it's used like a graduated cylinder, but you pour the liquid in the top, and by turning the little stopcock down here, you can let out the exact amount of liquid that you want. I hope each and every one of you will take the names of this equipment seriously and learn them. So when you see those directions that say, pour 50 milliliters of solution A into your graduated cylinder and then transfer that into your Erlenmeyer flask, you know what they're talking about. Let's take a look at some more science equipment. When we make measurements, three of the basic things that we try and find out are volume, length, and weight. Whenever we measure volume, particularly liquid volume, the instrument we use is the graduated cylinder. When we measure length, the instrument that we use is not the yardstick, but rather the meter stick. And you can see that it's subdivided into centimeters and millimeters. When we measure mass, which is sometimes confused with weight, we'll be using a piece of equipment called a balance. Instead of weighing the object, we will be massing the object. And that mass is recorded in metric units called grams. Got that? I've got two types of balances here. This first one is a double platform, double beam balance. It has two platforms and two beams. The beams are the little arms that the counterweights slide on. This next balance I have is a single platform, triple beam balance. And you'll see that it only has one platform and three beams. Next on my left over here, we have that famous piece of equipment, the Bunsen burner, invented by a man named Robert Bunsen. Next to the Bunsen burner is what we call a ring stand. It's a stand with rings on it. This ring stand has a triangle in it, easy to remember because it's in the shape of a triangle. It's used to hold things. And of course, I'm going to set my crucible in the triangle. Over on my right, I have what's called a tripod stand, easy to remember because it's got three legs. 
Underneath this beaker is a piece of wire mesh with a fiber center. This is used to support the beaker when we're heating it. Then we have a lot of special tools in science. And once again, you want to use the right tool for the right job. If you're doing any dissections, you've probably seen these before, dissection pans. And inside this dissection pan, we have a dissection kit. Let's take a look at what we have here. This top item is called a scalpel, used for cutting things. Then we have a pair of scissors. These are special scissors called dissecting scissors. Then there's two pair of forceps, a straight one and a bent one. These are not called tweezers, but forceps. Then we have two different types of teasing needles. There's one with a straight tip and one with a bent tip. And then this final item down here is called a probe. It's blunt on the end and it's used for probing around things. Inside the dissecting pan, you'll see special pins. These are T-pins for holding down specimens. Then when you're working with your microscope, you have to know what a microscope slide is. And then along with the microscope slide, we have little tiny square pieces of glass or plastic that we put over it. These are called cover slips. Then we have special types of tools that we pick up our glassware with. These, as you might guess, are for beakers. They're called beaker tongs, and we will use them to pick up a beaker. They're not used for anything else, and in fact, you wouldn't want to try and pick up a beaker like this with them. It just doesn't work. Beakers always get picked up like this with the beaker tongs. We also have another type of tongs called crucible tongs. These can be used to fish things out of acid or something like that, but also pick up crucibles. Then we have another type of tong called a flask tong. These are strange looking guys. Take a look at that. These are used in picking up flasks. Finally, we have a few odds and ends. These are called wood splints, and they allow you to light something up and not be as close as a match might get you. Then we have thermometers. Everybody knows what they are, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And of course, if you have to pick up a test tube, you want to use a test tube holder. That's this little clamp device right here. Now with all that science equipment you've just seen, I bet many of you are thinking, hey, that's a lot of stuff. How am I ever going to learn all those names? Well, remember there's a lot of items that you probably already know, like test tubes and beakers and maybe even graduated cylinders. But more important than the name is knowing how to properly use each piece of equipment. For example, we can't have you massing 50 grams when the directions call out for 5. So this takes us to the next segment, the standard laboratory techniques and safety practices that we use in science. Whether you're working with science at home or in the classroom, two of the most dangerous experiments are those concerning fire and chemicals. And sometimes in science, the unexpected happens and you should be prepared. Ask yourself some simple questions. What would you do if? Let's take this Bunsen burner for example. What would you do if flames started shooting out where the barrel connects to the base? So it's important that you're prepared for any emergency. If you're working with a Bunsen burner like this one, you should make sure that the hoses are on tight. And if you ever have a malfunction like the one we just saw, always head for the main gas valve and turn it off there. And if you're working with a Bunsen burner and you have loose clothing, be sure that it doesn't get in the way of the flames. If you have long hair, you should have it tied back. Now one of the most dangerous things to do is an unauthorized experiment. That's where you're experimenting on your own without following directions. Your teacher's not going to like that. Even something kind of harmless like burning a pencil over the Bunsen burner would be an unauthorized experiment. Let's take a look at this unauthorized experiment and see just how dangerous some of them might be. We're going to be using a chemical called mystery powder number X5. And at the top of our instruction sheet, we see this big danger sign that says, don't let this chemical come in contact with anything organic. So we must know what the word organic means. And of course, that means anything that's alive now or was alive at one time. So is it okay to pick this chemical up with an aluminum teaspoon and put it in a glass test tube? Yes, but we better not touch it. Now the first instruction might say, take one quarter teaspoon of this mystery powder and put it in a very clean test tube. Why do you think we should have a very clean test tube? Well, of course, because of contaminants. There might be something organic left over from a previous experiment inside the test tube. So let's go ahead and take one quarter teaspoon of this material and put it in our test tube. Instruction number two might say, 
Gently heat this material over the flame until it just melts and then let it cool back down until it solidifies again. Since we're working with fire and chemicals, we definitely should have our safety goggles on in this experiment and also it's very important to move all the major supply of chemical well out of the way of the flame. And when they say heat gently, they mean just move it in and out of the flame a little bit. Don't just hold it under the flame. And never ever point a test tube at yourself or at anyone else in the classroom. It's always good to kind of keep it at an angle and point it away from all people. Now what we're going to do first is light up this Bunsen burner. And once again, it's important to start by controlling the main Bunsen burner gas with the main valve and then adjust the other valve if you have one. So we'll light it up now. Once the Bunsen burner is adjusted, we're ready to do the experiment. Now let's say that there's one guy in the back of the class who always likes to do unauthorized experiments. He's a troublemaker. We'll say his name's Mike. Seems for some reason Mikes are always getting in trouble. So he's going to heat this chemical gently, moving it in and out of the flame until it just melts. And then he's going to sneak something else in the test tube, something organic. These two little pieces of wood splint. Well, let's see what happens when he does this. First, we want to melt this down until it turns to a liquid. Then we have Mike in the back of the room, and he's going to put these little popsicle sticks in the chemical. Well, watch what happens. Uh-oh, Mike is in serious trouble. You can't hide something like that very easy in the science classroom. And this is a good example of what could happen to you if you tried an unauthorized experiment. Sometimes we have to put together special apparatus for use in the science lab. Let's take a look at this for example. We have a thistle tube funnel going through a cork stopper and then there's another glass tube to let the air out when the liquid goes in. Now glass tubing usually comes in long sizes and needs to be cut for particular applications. There's a special way to cut it. You start with a triangular file and you set your glass tubing down on the table and you make a scratch mark on it. Step number two is to snap it by holding the scratch mark away from you and bending the glass tubing. But let's be a little bit on the safe side. Put our safety goggles on and hold the glass tubing with two pieces of paper towel. So let's point the scratch mark away from us and snap the glass tubing. As you can see, there's still sharp edges on this glass tubing. So the next step is to fire polish it. We do that by holding it in the flame of a Bunsen burner and melting the glass just a little bit and smoothing out the edges. Remember that this glass tubing is going to be very hot, so be sure and let it cool off before you touch it. We're now ready to insert this tubing into a rubber stopper. But before we do that, we should make it nice and slippery. You can use water, glycerin, or soap. I'm going to use a little bit of soap. We'll make this nice and slippery here. The next step is to insert this tube into the rubber stopper. But before we do that, we need to grasp it with a piece of towel or cloth and hold it near the base. Then we'll carefully push the stopper with a twisting motion onto the glass tube. When you're through using this apparatus, it's a good idea to take it apart because sometimes the tubing will freeze up inside the stopper and the only way to get it out then is to actually cut the stopper in half. The reason we're doing this procedure is to keep you from cutting yourself the event that the tubing snaps and maybe jams you in the hand. And speaking of cuts, dissecting tools are real dangerous and you should handle them with respect. You may be dissecting a frog and working with dissecting needles or a scalpel. Be sure that your fingers don't get in the way. And while we're talking about tools, there are lots of tools in the science classroom and at home that can be quite dangerous. Let's take a look at these cutters, for example. There's a great mechanical advantage because of the long lever arm between the fulcrum and where the force is applied. And think of the force that can be applied on these two little cutting edges. And when you're grinding or chiseling rocks, you should definitely have your safety goggles on. In astronomy, sometimes we have to take observations of the sun. There's no material that I know of that's safe to look directly at the sun through. That includes film negatives and smoked glass. The best way to look at the sun is an indirect way, using a very tiny piece of mirror and projecting the sun's circle onto a piece of white paper. And when working with electricity, confine your experiments to low voltages or those using batteries. Avoid experimenting with household current. It can kill. When you plug in equipment, hold the plug firmly and insert it into the outlet. 
When you remove a plug, always pull it out by holding the plug and not the cord. Also, keep an eye open for frayed or bare wires. These can be very dangerous. Now let's get back to chemistry. Whenever you're boiling a liquid in a test tube, you should use boiling stones or a water bath. Boiling stones are little bits of non-reacting rock or glass that are placed in with the liquid. When the liquid boils, we get tiny bubbles from the stones rather than the big ones we would get without them. A water bath is a beaker of water with our test tube inside. As the water heats up, our test tube will also heat up, but slowly, and only to 100 degrees C, the boiling point of water. Sometimes we may have to smell a chemical. It may be an instruction in the handout sheet, or we may just have to find out what it is. There's a proper technique to do this. First hold the chemical about an arm's length away and wave your hand over the top. Try and carry some of the vapors toward your nose. See if you can tell what it is. If you can't, move it a little bit closer and repeat the process. Continue to repeat the process until you can either find out what it is or find out that it has no odor. Now it may seem kind of dumb having to do this. But if you've ever stuck your nose directly into a beaker with household ammonia in it or ammonium hydroxide, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the best way to smell something is the proper scientific way. Now there are two other types of chemicals that are real nasty, acids and bases. Let's take a look at acids and first see how to properly pour an acid. The first step is to have a clear working area, so we'll move a couple of these things aside. Step number two is to make sure that you have your safety goggles on because acids, as I said, are very nasty chemicals and you don't want to get any acid in your eye. What we're going to do is take some acid from this reagent bottle and pour it into this beaker. Notice that the reagent bottle is sitting in a Petri dish. This is to make sure that if there are any drips, they'll fall and collect in the Petri dish and not touch the table. The other important thing to remember is never let the glass stopper touch the table. The proper way to take the stopper out is to grasp the bottle firmly with one hand, turn your hand upside down, and between these two fingers, reach in and remove the stopper. You will then be able to lift the reagent bottle up and carefully and slowly pour the acid into the beaker. Make sure once again that you hold it over the Petri dish in case there are any spills. Once you've reinserted the glass stopper, it's always a good practice to wash your hands off because you might have picked some acid up on the back of your hand when you pulled that stopper out. So, and in fact, I'm starting to feel a little stinging sensation on the back of these two fingers, so I might have gotten a little bit of acid on them. Sometimes, we have to mix acid and water to dilute it down. The main question is, which do we pour into which? The acid into the water or the water into the acid? One way is very dangerous, and the other way is the safe way. Well, the way to remember this is the famous A&W root beer rule. Acid always goes in to water. A into W. So let's pour some right now. I'm going to use my Petri dish as a cover for the table, and I'm going to pour this sulfuric acid into this water. And note also that when I pour it, I pour it with extreme caution and very slowly because this is an exothermic reaction. This mixture will heat up. Both acids and bases are very dangerous and should be treated with respect. One time I was working with some very concentrated sulfuric acid and I was using a pipette and I had to take 1.8 milliliters of acid into the pipette and transfer it into another liquid. I didn't have one of these syringes at the time, and when I was sucking it up with my mouth, some of it actually sucked up right into my mouth, and then my teeth actually started sizzling. It was really scary. Whenever you use a pipette, always use one of these little mechanical bulbs on the end so that you can squeeze the air out and then suck in the right amount of liquid. Never, ever use your mouth on the end of a pipette. I learned that one the hard way. Now, I bet a lot of you are thinking, what did you do when your teeth started sizzling? Well, here's another rule you have to remember. If you ever get acids or bases on your skin or your clothes, you need to flood the area with lots of water. Unfortunately, at the time, I was working near a lagoon, and the only water nearby was salt water. It was lagoon water, and I had to rinse my mouth out with that. Then I raced to the nearest store and drank some milk. If you ever happen to get acid in your eye, you want to definitely get to the nearest water supply and rinse the eye out. Hold your eye under a water faucet if necessary and rinse it from the inside out, never from the outside in or it could wash acid into your other eye. 
This is true for other chemicals too. Water is the universal solvent, and if you contaminate your skin or your clothes with just about any chemical, the best thing to do is to wash the area with water. And usually they say about 15 minutes is a sufficient amount of time. Another story. I was carrying a car battery once, taking it to the store for exchange. And I guess some of the acid must have sprayed out the top, and I wasn't paying attention. And look at what it did to this t-shirt. You see lots of tiny little holes caused by the acid when it burned through the fabric. Now one final demonstration to emphasize just how dangerous acids can be. In this cylinder, I have some very concentrated acid. What I'm going to do is lower this seashell into it. Now seashells are made of pretty much the same material that your teeth are made of, so you can see what happens when this seashell touches the acid. We see a chemical change starts to take place right away. We know this because there's a gas produced. I'm going to quickly remove this before the seashell gets totally eaten away, put it in this Petri dish down in the sink, and cover my acid up once again, because there are some fumes coming from it. I've actually tried this experiment previously, and here's what happened to the first seashell I tried. Burned two holes right through the shell, and this shell was in the acid only for about 30 seconds. This demonstration should convince you to treat acids with respect. And remember that strong bases are just as bad, so treat them with respect too. Now most safety rules are just common sense. For example, you don't want to throw a hot match into a trash can. You could have a trash can fire. Instead, put it in a glass or metal container or douse it with water. Know where all the emergency equipment is in your room and learn how to use it. This includes eyewash fountains, fire blankets, extinguishers, and alarms. Listen closely to verbal directions given by your teacher. And if he or she calls for attention while you're working, immediately stop what you're doing and listen closely. Always work with a lab partner. And whenever you're measuring something, ask your lab partner to double check your measurement. If you both can't agree, then ask the teacher to check it. And if you're ever doing your own science project at home, make sure that your project plan is safe. Have it approved by your teacher first. You know, I've had a lot of fun making this program because I really enjoy doing science experiments. And as you do more experiments, you'll realize that science is perhaps the most fun subject there is. So learn all the science you can. Maybe even become a science teacher and show your students something like mystery powder number X5. But remember, always make your science safe science, even if your name is Mike or Michelle. <laughs>